And that's why I think when you see tech companies succeed, they succeed so wonderfully, right? Because they've solved so many of their problems through software, it scales, it's repeatable, it's high margin. And so as the company gets scale, right, the, the sort of economics of their business get better and better and better because so much of what they've solved for has been solved through the software. So what is a tech company? A tech company is a, a company that solves problems first and foremost through software rather than through hiring functional expertise. So hi, and welcome to another episode of the People Hum interview series. This is your host Ria at People Hum. Before we begin, just a quick introduction about People Hum. People Hum is an end-to-end, -end, one view, integrated human capital management automation platform. The winner of the 2019 Global Cody Award for Etsia that's specifically built for crafted employee experiences and the future of work. We run the People Hum blog and channel that receives more than 400,000 visitors a year and we also publish several interviews with well-known names globally every month. And now for our guest, Caribo is an operator turned venture capitalist. He's a partner at Sempervirin's Venture Capital, which is a boutique VC fund focused on the future of work, specifically startups whose products are sold to or through the employer, including workplace tech, health tech, fintech and insure tech. Focused on catalyzing digital transformation of financial services, data-driven marketing, HR and insure tech, he helps build bridges among entrepreneurs, investors and industry executives. Besides this, he's also the chairman of InsureTech Connect, co-founder of Blueprint and chairman of HR Transform. He has published several articles in Leaders Edge magazine on ICOs and the future state of InsureTech. He focuses on everything and anything related to how people work and live better lives and help people to launch or grow their great ideas. With that, let me welcome you, Karibo, and it's a pleasure to have you on our interview series. Well, thanks for having me, Ria. That's a very generous introduction you made. I appreciate it. Thank you it. so much. I, I, I'm really glad that you liked it. So let's uh, deep dive into the questions. Okay, so you've had a phenomenal journey so far, uh, as you know, as validated by the introduction I did. So please, could you share some of the learnings you've had along the way? Yeah, uh, so, you know, it's been about 25 years of my career so far. Hopefully I have a few more left in me, but a uh, big question like, okay, learnings over 25 years. I I'll try to boil them down into, a, into just a few for you. Um, first of all, um, don't, let in don't let inertia, um, take over your career. Um, you know, I, I like to think about the framework, sort of how many days a week do you look forward to going into work? How many days a week uh, are you sort of ambivalent? And how many days a week do you dread it? And, uh, you know, there was a point in my career after 10 years at the first company I worked at, Capital One, where uh, the sort of the ratio flipped, right? A, a good healthy ratio is three, one, one, right? Three days a week, you're really excited, looking forward to it. One day ambivalent, one day sort of dread it. Every, every good job has days you're going to dread. But it, it had turned into one, one, three. One day a week, I was still looking forward to it. One day ambivalent, three days dreading it. And, and I realized at that point, you know, things were going great, but I'd become a victim of my own inertia, my own sort of comfort there. Um, and, and so just sort of always ask yourself every now and then, you know, how, uh, what's my ratio look like that? Uh, second thing I'd say is authenticity, right? Authenticity goes a long way in your career and working with, with people. And, uh, you know, much will be forgiven if you are authentic in, uh, in how you do things, uh, including in when you make mistakes, and we all make mistakes. Um, and then lastly, I'd say, you know, look for opportunities to do things in your work that you're not at all qualified to do. Uh, because that will, will develop you faster than any other sort of activity. Um, right. If you have talent, right, and uh, enthusiasm and authenticity, um, you know, look for those opportunities to do things that you that you know you don't know how to do yet, uh, because that's that's how you accelerate your trajectory. Oh, that's actually a very great answer. When you were speaking of the ratios, I think a lot of people struggle with, uh, you know, detaching themselves and leaving a company they have worked for in a very long time and kind of how to say no. That's a, that has been a struggle with people. And uh, as for, you know, constantly reskilling yourself and upskilling yourself, I think that's very important. So thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, moving forward, uh, what do you think are the major blows that 
sectors like health tech, fintech, and insure tech have experienced in light of this pandemic? And what do you think is the future of work of these sectors? Yeah, so, you know, I, I'd start with a framework here, sort of thinking about it in the big picture. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure many of the people viewing this now sort of are familiar with the notion of a platform shift, right? Particularly a computing platform shift, right? You start with mainframes, uh, you know, decades ago. Um, then the PC was a platform shift. Then the web was a platform shift. Then mobile was a platform shift, right? And, and there's certain hallmarks of platform shifts you look for, right? They, they make a whole bunch of legacy ways of doing things obsolete, a whole bunch of legacy assumptions about how things get done, right? Yeah. Have to get thrown in the trash bin. Um, and at the same time, a platform shift like brings entire new continents of opportunity right, uh, above the sea. And I think that COVID uh, is actually a platform shift. Right? In, it, of course, it's not technically a computing platform shift, but it resembles, it has all the hallmarks of a platform shift. It's a cultural platform shift. So a lot of sort of assumptions and uh, ways of doing things become obsolete but entire new opportunities also sort of rise out of the sea um, uh, as a result. So in that context, you know, I, I think that you have to look for where are the sort of legacy ways of doing things in, in healthcare and in financial services and insurance, where are those sort of suddenly become obsolete? Right, so healthcare, you know, the sort of in-person delivery of some aspects of healthcare, right? becomes, you know, almost moot, right? Certainly a lot harder to deliver in a world of COVID, right? So you see the rise of the, the telemedicine uh, continent sort of emerge there. Um, you know, you look at, um, you know, financial services, banking, right? On the consumer side, at least, you see the, the branch, right? Becomes a little bit less interesting, right? You don't necessarily want people walking in, right? If you can avoid it. And thus, the sort of it opens up more opportunity for remote banking, the neo banks, the digital first banks, uh, insurance. You think about, uh, hey, I had an accident uh, with my car. Right? Do I really need to have someone come to me physically to inspect the car, or can I, you know, take some take some photos of it uh, with my phone and have some machine learning applied to that, so we don't have the human to human direct physical interaction, right, of the adjuster. Um, and so all of those create new opportunities, right? As you, it, it also creates disruption, right? If you're a claims adjuster for an insurance company, you might need to look, look over your shoulder and say, well, maybe my, my job is not quite as necessary. Um, if I'm sort of entirely focused my medical practice on uh, in-person delivery of medical care, I need to start thinking about how do I layer in some telehealth there as well. You know, COVID, COVID has accelerated Right, a great deal, and and obviously, right, this all plays into future of work, right? Um, you know, as uh, offices get uh, at least temporarily closed, but then a whole bunch of assumptions, right, about how the world works, about what was necessary, get thrown into the trash bin, right? As we say, oh well, we don't always need to be spending five days a week in class to be each other to get our work. We still will need to dispense can be done well, right, uh, remotely. True collaboration, right, is still difficult without uh, uh, the uh, in-person aspect. So hopefully that gives a few, a little bit of a, a context and framework for where things might go. I think, uh, you know, calling COVID a platform shift is like really innovative and it's, it's like, you know, imbibing in everybody that you don't have to be scared and you do not have to be paralyzed. It's just like a new challenge. And as we constantly adapt to all the technological changes or all the political and government changes happening in the scenario, we kind of need to take this as a challenge and, you know, constantly update ourselves and just find ways of, uh, you know, provide, finding solutions to deal with it. Uh, and I, I think that's the best way to move forward. And talking about, uh, you know, the technological advancement as well as financial services, uh, there has been a lot of digital transformation in financial services and in short tech. So how do you think that is helping build bridges between uh, entrepreneurs and startups? Yeah, it's, it's interesting, you know, when you, when you zone in on financial services and insurance and the overlap for the for the startup and entrepreneurial community. Right? Um, it, it's been interesting because 
lately, there's been at least a handful of startups that are sort of specifically trying to serve the entrepreneurs and the venture back community. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of a niche, but it's a very, very interesting niche um, if you can serve it really well. So, you know, a, a few examples, um, you know, there's a, a company called Brex, right, which is providing credit cards right, specifically for the sort of Silicon Valley type of company uh, that, you know, if a company has $10 million of funding, right, it's probably a pretty good credit risk for a credit card. But traditional, but it might have very little cash flow yet, right? Or it might be have negative cash flow. That's why it raised the venture capital money. Um, and so your traditional way of underwriting a small business might say, "Oh, this is a terrible credit risk. I would never hand them a credit card," right? But Brex looks at it and says, "Well, I look at the funding and who's backing it, and you know, do they have the capital there? And that's a good reason to give them a credit card." There's uh, same thing in the insure tech space. Uh, there's a company uh, I've chatted with called Vouch. Right. Which again, like the last thing that an entrepreneur wants to deal with is thinking that, okay, how do, what kind of insurance do I need? How do I get that insurance? Right. I've got a hundred problems I'm trying to do to build this hyper growth, uh, venture back company. Um, insurance is not the thing I want to spend my time on. It's a, I have to get it. I have to get the right one, but you know, I don't want to, you know, but it's, and I don't want to go, you know, emailing back PDF forms and, and things like that. So vouch analogous to Brex is designed, you know, commercial insurance products for the, not just the small business, but for the sort of typical venture backed business. Um, you know, and, and, you know, there's even a, um, a benefits broker, right. For, you know, that helps with those kinds of companies, uh, the, the venture backed companies sort of managing the HR for, and the benefits package for those types of venture back companies. So I think you're, you're seeing um, more and more energy around realizing this is a real part of the economy and it doesn't look like other parts of the economy. You don't want to serve it uh, the same way, right? Different products, different go-to market actually make a lot of sense there. That's great. And, and you know, it's great to know that there are companies kind of looking out for all these entrepreneurs and startups and helping uh, them uh, and, you know, take off the ground. It's very difficult at a nascent stage for these, uh, you know, for these companies as well as in entrepreneurs and startups to navigate the market as well as navigate their business. Uh, and it's great that, uh, you know, at least there are companies kind of bringing them uh, together and bringing them together. Yes. So I, uh, you've re recently written an article on the APIification of insurance tech. So uh, how do you think the HR tech and insurance world are converging? Yeah, it, it's, it's personally interesting to me. Um, you know, I, I've uh, jumped a little bit from industry to industry over the course of time. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not the deepest guy in any one industry, that's, but that's for sure. But hopefully I get a little bit of insight from one industry to another. And, uh, you know, the insurance industry is not the fastest adopter of technology, um, it, although it's, it's really gotten unlocked in the last few years. Uh, you know, I think that uh, the same is probably true for HR, uh, although actually HR um, is probably a little bit faster even than insurance. Um, but what, what is, as, you, as your question alludes to, like there's starting to be this interesting sort of crossover between the two and especially as APIs uh, start to get their hooks into these parts of the, the world, it actually uh, opens up more opportunities. So you know, there's, there's uh, you see companies, you know, again, typically you're sort of venture back startups that are building uh, API infrastructure into things like the HR systems, right? So there's a company called Pinwheel that is specifically building APIs uh, uh, to be able to access into payroll data, right, and and things like that, so that uh, some third party company that wants to access payroll about a consumer with that employee's consent, of course, can do so, right. Otherwise, it's locked into the payroll system, really hard to get. And but look, if I'm an employee and I've I've got you know this long track record of getting paid, right, that's actually really important data that can accrue to my benefit as an as a consumer. If I'm employ if I'm applying for a mortgage somewhere, let's say, right, I might not have great credit uh, or great a long credit record, but if I've got a long employment record, well, that should be counted in my favor. 
companies like Pinwheel, building those APIs, open it up. There's also been sort of API-based you know, data mediation layers or data exchanges uh, specifically popping up to, to link up the broker side and the carrier side, right? And I've seen this in the, the benefits world, the employee benefits world, uh, companies like Noyo and Veracred specifically doing that. And it's, it's a real pain point that they're solving is my understanding. Um, there's um, other companies as well as sort of building that out sort of more broadly. Um, you know, High Wing is another one I've, I've encountered that looks really interesting. They just, I saw they just got an investment from a company, from a, a VC firm called Broker Tech Ventures. Like that gives you a sense of like who they're trying to serve. Um, and then, you know, I think that there's companies that are maybe not building um, APIs per se, but building products, right? That of course leverage APIs, modern architecture uh, to serve the insurance needs of companies. So um, there's a company called Pi Insurance here that I, that I know. Um, and they're really focused on delivering great workers comp, right? And, you know, on a, on a modern architecture, sort of, um, uh, sort of using all data sources they can from an underwriting perspective. And they're, you know, laser focused on building out great workers comp products, right? Um, that, of course, you know, uh, brokers and all are going to, to want to offer to their clients. So I think there's a, you know, it's just a, a great time where, you know, across both HR and insurance and at the sort of overlap in the Venn diagram, we're seeing innovators point their efforts uh, towards all of those. I think you gave uh, such great examples and you know this merger between the insurance world and the HR world is just opening the world to new possibilities and maybe in the future we can see like you know different sectors collaborating and exploring possible synergies between each other. Um, so lastly do you have any sound bites you want to leave our audience with? <laughs> I, I like sound bites that, that's fun. Um, for, for, I'll, I'll give you two sound bites. Um, sure. uh, one that's really succinct and, and, and good and one that's a little bit more uh, belabored. But the, the first one, uh, I have to say, I'm actually plagiarizing, right? It, it, I'm copying it from uh, one of my business partners who, who I work with in, in launching these conferences. Uh, and uh, the sound bite is, you know, really trying to answer the question, what is a digital revolution? And the answer, the answer I really like um, again, I can't take credit for it personally. What is a digital revolution? It's a rethinking, not just what is possible, but what is the new normal? I really like that because, you know, the world of possibilities is great, right? Um, but that unto itself is not, you know, the nature of a digital revolution, right? When we think about, you know, what's happened with Netflix, right? It's not just change the possibility, right? It's actually reset our, our expectations about the new normal or how I'm going to consume content, right? And, and you eventually, once you reset the new normal, that's when you see other companies in the industry start to follow, right? Now you see all these other companies, including, you know, Disney, right? Um, sort of putting their effort behind the, the efforts that, that Netflix uh, sort of uh, created in establishing a, a new normal. And that's, that's a digital revolution. My other soundbite, uh, at least I can take credit for this one, I don't have to, to uh, uh, claim plagiarizing for it, um, is uh, sort of a definition of what is a tech company. Because I've been asked, and, and this is particularly in like the insurance world, what is a tech company? What makes something a tech company? And uh, you know, is, is Google a tech company or is it a, an advertising company? Is Facebook a tech company or is it a media company? Right. Is Amazon a tech company or is it a retailer? And so when I think about what makes a tech company, it's defined by the default approach to solving problems. If a company faces a problem and their gut reaction, their reflex is to hire an engineer and try to solve it through software, it's a tech company. So if I have a marketing problem and I try to hire an engineer to write software for it, if I have a finance issue I need to resolve and my approach is to hire an engineer to write some software, 
If I've got an operations issue and I hire a software engineer as my starting point, then I'm a tech company. In contrast, if I have a marketing problem and I hire a senior marketer, if I have a finance problem and I hire another finance person, an ops problem and I hire another ops person, I'm not a tech company. I might be a great company, right? but I'm not a tech company. And you'll notice, right, there's nothing here about how long I've been in business or how many employees I have or anything like that, which defines being a tech company or not. Google can be a tech company still with 100,000 employees and billions and billions of revenue because I believe that they still try to solve problems by default with software by hiring an engineer. And that, I think it's actually a very empowering notion of what makes a tech company because it means that actually a 100-year-old legacy insurance company, as an example, has the option to try to build that muscle right, and re-anchor re themselves for how they solve problems. They at least have the, the choice. Do I want to build this new reflex that when I have a problem to face to solve, I will focus on when I first try to hire an engineer and solve it through software. And of course, often, let's be clear, often when you solve these problems, these functional area problems, by hiring an, an engineer and having them write some software, often it does not work. Right? Often, you have to actually go ahead and say, well, yeah, we do need another functional expert human in the mix here. And that's fine because you can always fall back to that. But when your reflex approach of solving a problem through software, when it does work, and often it does in fact work, even when people weren't expecting it to, it's a beautiful thing because it's very scalable. It's very high margin. Right? It's very repeatable. Right. As, the prob as a finance problem gets a hundredfold bigger, right, you can scale up your server farm by a hundredfold, right? instead of scaling up your cube farm of finance people by a hundredfold. And that's why I think when you see tech companies succeed, they succeed so wonderfully, right? because they've solved so many of their problems through software. It scales, it's repeatable, it's high margin. And so as the company gets scale, right, the the sort of economics of their business get better and better and better because so much of what they've solved for has been solved through the software. So what is a tech company? Tech company is a, a company that solves problems first and foremost through software rather than through hiring functional expertise. It's actually very insightful, I think. I had a lot to learn from this interview and I'm sure our viewers will learn a lot from your interview as well. I think you've introduced us to some new concepts and some new terms as well as kind of change our perspective on how to look at things and how to move forward. So once again, I would like to thank you for being a part of this interview series and it was a great pleasure talking to you and all the best to you and your business. Well, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate thank it. You.